We're in Isaiah. Last time we talked about uh, encryption. We talked about um, chapter 7 and the politics that are revealed by the hidden encryptions in the first part of chapter 7. We also talked about the famous prophecy of the virgin birth in verse 14 of chapter 7. First time the virgin birth is hinted at is Genesis 3.15 when God declares war on Satan. And of course the prophecy in Isaiah is the dramatic one. We dealt with that last time. And if by... uh, memory serves me correctly, we got through the end of chapter 7, right? By the way, uh, I sometimes kid, you know, I always say that the book of Isaiah is written by Handel, right? And obviously I'm being flippant. But because I made that crack a couple of times, I thought, gee, I better do a little homework. And uh, turns out Handel, right, of course I'm referring to is this famous piece called the Messiah. We've, uh, we usually hear that around one of the major holidays, either Easter or especially Christmas. Turns out in about the 1730s, Handel did start undertaking biblical themes, something on Saul and, and uh, Israel and Egypt and other things. In 1741, get this, 1741, Handel was invited by the Duke of Devonshire to Dublin to write a piece. And this piece of music, which I think a full score, if you listen to the whole, not just excerpt, the whole thing takes about three hours. He wrote that in two weeks. So you guys thought you were under pressure with deadlines, you know? Now, I'm not that impressed because he had a lot of help on the lyrics. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, of course. It's quite a piece. Okay, so we're in Handel chapter 8. And chapter 8, Isaiah takes up again. Again, to get the context here, Isaiah is writing to and about Jerusalem and Judah, the southern kingdom. And by the way, I'd like to put something else to bed here too. As you know, after Solomon, there was Rehoboam and there was a civil war. Rehoboam and Jeroboam had their differences and the nation split in two. We have the northern kingdom, which is known as the house of Israel, and we have the southern kingdom known as the house of Judah. We classically visualize those two portions of the nation as ten tribes to the north and two tribes to the south, Judah and Simeon to the south, and the ten tribes in the north. And of course, as you know, the northern kingdom, Israel, fell into idolatry more quickly. If you plot this sequence of kings it goes from bad to worse. They made Samaria as their capital. They worshiped idols. God kept warning them through a variety of prophets and things. And about 722 BC, the Assyrians conquer them, take them slaves, and that's the end of the northern kingdom. You never see it again. There are many prophecies in the Old and the New Testament that says they're going to be reunited. And of course, that's millennial. The southern kingdom, the house of Judah, as it's called, has its succession of kings, and they're not a lot better, but there's an occasional one that shows a little more class than the others. But ultimately, they decline, and about a century after the northern kingdom falls, the southern kingdom falls to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Now, one of the things I keep running into, and I'm sure you have too, if you haven't, you will, there are those that talk about the lost ten tribes of Israel. And from that conception in literature emerge all kinds of rather interesting ideas that have just one small problem. They're not true. There is no such thing as the lost ten tribes. I don't know if you've heard that. How many have heard about the ten tribes of Israel? Okay. I'd like you to go with me into Second Chronicles about chapter 11. Now, this is right at the time that Rehoboam and Jeroboam are having their big problem. Rehoboam being the king of Judah, the house of the south, and Jeroboam leading this revolt of the bunch in the north. We'll pick up the context, say, about verse 14 of Second Chronicles 11. For the Levites left their suburban lands and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. Get the context now. First of all, recognize that the nation of Israel was divided territorially by tribe. In other words, when Joshua entered the land, they finally conquered the land. They divvied the land up by lot, and certain areas were allocated to the various tribes. That's one of the reasons why genealogies are so important in the Judaistic situation, because you never really sold land. When they speak of a sale, they really mean a lease, because there were circumstances under which the land that was sold could revert back to the family. The Jubilee year being one of those mechanics, and another thing being the right of the Redeemer, the kinsman Redeemer, a kinsman of the family that sold it, could, if he performed the necessary acts as detailed on the exterior of the scroll, would be able to redeem the land for the family. 
And the best example of that is the book of Ruth, in which that whole issue is a major part. And it's very important to understand the book of Ruth, or you'll never understand Revelation chapter 5 with the seven-sealed book and what Jesus Christ is doing, acting as our kinsman redeemer. We talked about that last time because of the virgin birth and so on. So when you think of the northern kingdom of Israel, that included the territory that was originally allocated to ten tribes. Judah represented the house of Judah represented the territory allocated to Simeon and Judah and, frankly, part of Benjamin, because Jerusalem's actually right on the edge there. Now, bear in mind, the Levites did not inherit land. They inherited cities, if you recall, from the, from the allocation in Joshua and so on, because the Levites were a tribe apart. They did not have military service, and they didn't have land to inherit. The Lord was their inheritance. They did have certain cities allocated to them. Now, get the picture. Rehoboam has under his territory Jerusalem, the priesthood, the true worship. The northern kingdom that's rebelling is driven by idol worship. As the war starts, what do the Levites do? They abandon their cities and go south to Jerusalem, because their equity, of course, is with Jerusalem, the temple, and all of that. So verse 14, the Levites left their suburban lands, their possession, and came to Judah and Jerusalem, for Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. But we go on, verse 15, and he appointed for himself, that is Jeroboam, the king of the north, he appointed for himself priests for the high places, and for the he-goats, and for the calves which he had made. Bear in mind, the Torah has no place in his, he's, he's idol-worshipping, he set up his own priesthood system. He's abandoning the Torah, he's abandoning the whole tradition from Moses and the rest. But verse 16 is the one you might want to mark to return to when these issues come up. Because after the Levites, after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. The point I'm trying to make is, Under those conditions, what happened, the faithful to the Torah in the northern kingdom migrated south because that's where the true worship was going on. They were uncomfortable with the idol worship, so they abandoned the northern lands and went south. I don't think the Scripture says this explicitly, but I also infer that those in the south that were not faithful, that wanted to seek idols, migrated north. So years later, when the Assyrians finally capture, when God puts the northern kingdom into judgment, it isn't that they are ten pure tribes that are captured by the Assyrians, but rather a collection of the nation Israel that were apostate. Follow me? So there really isn't a cogent, crisp collection of of wanderers called the ten tribes that somehow got lost in history and reemerged in Britain to become the throne of uh, Britain and all of that. There's a whole doctrine called British Israelism, And it's interesting, it's provocative, but it's just not true. Other than that, it's fine. So that keeps coming up when we talk about the northern ten tribes. That's really erroneous. That's a a tragic label. Just like when you talk about the West Bank, that's a term of Israel's enemies. You and I should use the term Judea and Samaria. In any case, so much for the ten tribes. But to get the picture now, Isaiah is talking at a time that Assyria is emerging as the dominant world empire. We read in chapter 7, the early part, how Syria, don't confuse Syria with Assyria. Assyria is further to the east, the south of the Euphrates. But Syria and the northern kingdom conspired against Judah, but God, through Isaiah, told them not to sweat it. They won't even exist for very long. So what, what Isaiah is going to do now in that chapter 8 is pick up this theme and talk about the overthrow of Syria, Damascus, and the northern kingdom, the house of Israel, its headquarters is Samaria. And he will do this for chapter 8 and 9. And again, just like the last time, right in the middle of this dirge of judgment based on the local politics emerges some interesting little elements that constantly surface in the book of Isaiah that go far beyond the local scene. But let's jump in. Chapter 8, verse 1, More of the Lord said unto me, Take a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning... Meher Shaal Hajbaz. Boy, Isaiah did not have a facility naming his kids. But the meaning of the name, the previous one meant a remnant shall return. This one means, <laughs> the translation is, is not a lot of help. Plunder speedeth 
and the booty hasteth. <laughs> I wonder what the kids in school said about him. I suppose it means haste makes waste. Those of you who want to do some background on this, the historical background that Isaiah is talking about is also mentioned in 2 Kings 16, and roughly in that area, and 2 Chronicles 29. But in any case, Isaiah has two sons, and they're both named prophetically. The first one he took with them when he went to Ahaz and made this uh, prophecy about the, the virgin birth. The idea of naming him the remnant shall return was intended to be a light at the end of the tunnel kind of label. Because on the one hand, Isaiah is saying, hey, there's going to be a huge judgment coming. On the other hand, a remnant will return. And the kid was named to keep that in front of, of everyone. Bear in mind, Isaiah, again, to remind you, is high rank. Many of the prophets came from the rural communities. Isaiah was the opposite. He had access to the court. He has direct access to the king. He was on an intimate basis with the high priest. The vocabulary of Isaiah is greater than any of the other writers in the Old Testament. It's very eloquent. Almost every element in rhetoric emerges in Isaiah, from poetry to alliteration, you name it. You can make a list of all the techniques of writing, and they all show up in Isaiah. And it's, it's the high ground of Hebrew writing. But in any case, um, Isaiah has these two kids that, uh, well, first of all, he's naming this one before he's born. He says, take a great roll, write in it, and it with a man's pen concerning Meher Shalal Hajbaz. <laughs> wow, that's a I don't think I can do that twice. Verse 2, And I took with me faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jebedekiah, and uh, or whatever. <laughs> so in other words, he writes this beforehand. And then he says, I went in unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. And then said the Lord unto me, Call his name, Meher Shalal Hajbaz. I can hear your mother calling, yeah. <laughs> Verse 4, For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, Forasmuch as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly, and rejoice in Rezin and Ramalia's son, now therefore behold the Lord, and he goes on. Let me explain a little bit. The waters of Shiloh, that's waters of peace. It's idiomatic of welcoming the waters of peace. And rather than that, they rejoice in Rezin and Ramalia's son. In other words, the people are favoring this alliance that Ahaz was trying to cook up with Rezin, who was the king of Assyria, and uh, Ramalia's son, who was the, that was Pekka, who was the king of the northern kingdom, which God was saying, don't get into those alliances. You don't need to. I'm going to take care of it for you. Verse 7, now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river. Now, in this case, the river is the Euphrates. And on the east side of the Euphrates was Assyria. This is the empire emerging, and that empire would be used by the Lord to conquer not only Syria, but also the northern kingdom. And that occurs in about 722 B.C., up upon the waters of the river. Strong and many, even the king of Assyria in all his glory, and he shall come up uh, over all its channels and go over all its banks, and he shall pass through or into Judah, and shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck, and the um, stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy Land, O Emmanuel, and so on. Verse 9 is regarded by most experts, most commentators, as a shifting of gears. It could fit into the whole dirge he's talking about here, and yet the scope of the language seems to go far beyond the particular thing that Isaiah is dealing with. It says, associate yourselves in the King James, or maybe more precisely, make an uproar, O ye peoples. And ye shall be broken in pieces, and give ear, all ye of far countries. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. The take counsel together also means, by the way, devise a device, for God is with us. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way the people saying, Say ye not a confederacy, or more precisely, a conspiracy, to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye, either fear, nor be afraid. In other words, Isaiah and his supporters are getting a lot of criticism because they're, they're selling a very unpopular view. I'll tie some of this back when we get to chapter 9, because there's an Armageddon tone to this too, and I'll come to that. But the primary reference here is the issue of the Assyrians— the fact that Isaiah is saying, don't make a confederation, but rather let the Lord deal with it. 
If you want an application verse from the evening, verse 13 fits pretty well. Because the counsel is, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. I think we're all guilty of seeing spooks, fearing other things. And what Isaiah is saying, which is the same thing that uh, 1 Peter 3.15 says, and uh, also Isaiah will pick up this uh, emphasis later in this book, is the idea that the only one you should really fear is the Lord himself. Sanctify the Lord. Set apart the Lord of hosts himself. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both of the houses of Israel, for a trap and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That language sound familiar? Yeah, the reason it does is that uh, that comes up in Romans chapter 9 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Those phrases are, uh, if you're familiar with both those epistles, both Peter and Paul draw up on Isaiah. And uh, if, if we tracked each one of these phrases in the New Testament, we'd, take all, we'd be page-turning all evening. You, as you go through Isaiah, you'll find, if you've never read Isaiah, you'll find major portions of it sound awfully familiar, and that's because the New Testament writers draw up on it so frequently. We'll take a couple of examples forthcoming here. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. See, now this is a case where the word Israel is used for the whole nation. That's another thing I wanted to caution you about, is the word Israel can be used denotatively to be the northern kingdom. The name Israel can also be used connotatively to mean the whole nation. And uh, the house of Judah, of course, being, even though it's a tribe, it speaks of the the house of Judah, the southern uh, portion of the kingdom. A synonym for the northern kingdom, which is sometimes called Israel, is also Ephraim. Of the ten tribes involved in the north, Ephraim was the dominant one, so the word Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim, is often used as the label for the whole northern house. So be alert to that. But in this case, we have the stone of stumbling. Who is the stone of stumbling? Jesus Christ, you betcha. And the rock of offense. One of the things you can do sometime when your spirit draws you is take a concordance and do a study of either stone or rock throughout the Scripture. And it's one of those places that will teach you and instruct you, you'll get the flavor of the fact, that these 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years are a single message system. And again, one of the examples of this, of course, is the use of idioms. If you want to give it a fancy name to impress your friends, they call it the principle of expositional constancy. And all that means is these idioms are used, whether it's by uh, Moses or Isaiah or Paul or whoever, consistently. Same idioms are used in general with consistency. As you know, my main preoccupation with the Scripture is that these 66 books are a designed message system. I believe every... Uh, number, every place name, every detail is there by engineering, by design. And one of the great discoveries is to recognize, to to discover that every page, every story, every detail, every genealogy is designed as as an integrated whole. And every detail in this book on every page points to Jesus Christ. That's a glib generalization, but the discovery of how vividly that's true, is one of the great exciting things about the book, to realize that it transcends time and space. Not only is it a singular message system, but it has its origin from outside our time domain. It demonstrates its divine origin by writing history before it happens. Not just the ancient history, but history that we're seeing unfold before our very eyes. Whether it be the rebuilding of the Temple in Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the city of Babylon, 62 miles south of Baghdad, or whether it's the emergence of a European superstate, what have you, it's all laid out. And that's what makes it breathtaking. It's one of the things that makes it breathtaking. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, I have not come to destroy the law, but to, but to fulfill it. He says, not one yacht or one tittle shall pass until all be fulfilled. A yacht or a tittle being a, a crossing the T or dotting of an I of the Hebrew script. The rabbis have an expression that we won't understand the text until the Messiah comes. When the Messiah comes, he will not only interpret the passages, he'll interpret the words. In fact, he'll interpret their very letters. In fact, he'll even interpret the spaces between the letters. And as you know, when I first heard that, I thought it was a colorful exaggeration. 
But the more I study, the more I discover that is very literally true, and it's exemplified by Matthew five seventeen and eighteen. But here again is one of those one of those ways you can start to sample that. Take the term stone or rock from Genesis one through Revelation twenty two, and you'll discover it all ties together. The the climax of that, in I think it's First Corinthians ten, where Paul really elaborates on that. That the rock in the Old Testament, the wilderness wanderings, speaks of Jesus Christ. When Daniel sees his vision in Daniel chapter 2, the stone that was cut without hands, smiting the image, same stone, stone rock, it speaks of Jesus Christ. You get more mystical, you take the term blood. The first seven appearances of the word blood in the scripture lay out the whole redemptive plan, God's plan for redemption. You can take almost any one of these words, and, and a word study following it through will be revealing. Okay, verse 15, And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord who hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwelleth in Mount Zion. So again, Isaiah alluding to these two children, one of which um, uh, speaks of the remnant shall return, and the other one speaking of the coming judgment, the taking of spoil that's eminent. Verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto those who are mediums, I think the term today would be channelers. I love this passage, it's great. And, and to, unto wizards that peep and that mutter. You know, it, <laughs> it's hard to improve on the King James, in my opinion. When they shall say unto you, seek unto those that are mediums and unto wizards that peep and mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? Should they seek on behalf of the living to the dead? How absurd it is. You know, it's interesting, you know, as I grew up and as I was reading the Bible, learning things, I could never quite relate to some of these injunctions. You go to Deuteronomy 18. In fact, we probably should, just to emphasize what's being talked about here, turn to Deuteronomy 18. I could never relate to some of these things because they sounded so medieval, so uh, archaic. I never dreamed. I never dreamed. I, I never thought I'd see the day. When the widespread major topic among the so-called intelligentsia are those same topics. New labels, we call them channelers, the new age, what have you. It's new labels for the same old heresies. Dangerous stuff. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who maketh his son or daughter pass through the fire, or who useth divination, or an observer of times, a phrase referring to what we call today astrology, among other things, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter of mediums, or a wizard. That's the ones that go peep and mutter, I guess. Or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. I don't know if you've been paying attention to the materials that are being distributed, or the exercises, the instruction that go on in the California schools to your kids. But they're taught in school, officially, in this state especially, but across the country too, I think, to understand how to find their spirit guide. There are all kinds of exercises that are encouraged in the early grades in school, developmental, presumably, exercises that are setting them up for this kind of thing. If you haven't gotten into it, I encourage you to do some homework, find out what's going on in school, but be prepared for a shock as to what we're doing. The kind of conditioning, the kind of programming that's going on on the kids emerging out of our schools in the state. Frightening. These things are called entries by the technicians. I, you may recall the movie um, The Exorcist. And I remember when Walter Martin was uh, starting to do some research on William Blatty to debunk it, he was startled to find that he'd read out his homework, that uh, while he didn't agree with the way the movie went, and the ending particularly, it was interesting that that was based on a case study, several put together, valid research. How did all that start? Obviously, the movie took some dramatic side roads, but the main point is there's a valid case study in New Jersey. And it's interesting what starts all that, a Ouija board. These things are dangerous. 
fooling around with some of the new age things are dangerous. It's not just a question of heresy and a diver, you know, heterodox approach to life or whatever. They're, it's far deeper than that, far more frightening than that. Dangerous stuff. And if you're interested in this area, there's obviously a number of experts. One of the ones that impressed me is the writings and tapes by Joanna Michelson. That's Hal Lindsey's wife's sister. Bright lady, a lot of background, dynamite stuff. I love one of her recent tapes. Her title of the tape is, Can You Truly Find a Happy Medium? <laughs> Bright, witty gal, lots of solid background. She's got uh, a book about the children, Lambs to the Slaughter. And uh, any Christian bookstore, ask for the writings of Joanna Michelson and take a look at them. I think you'll find them very competent, quite provoking, very scriptural. Okay, moving on. Verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through it, greatly distressed and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward, and they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness." We could spend a lot of time on this because obviously it had a local application to the judgment that was coming on, on them that Isaiah was focusing on. It doesn't take much spiritual insight to recognize there's a second application in a global sense forthcoming in the 70th week of Daniel sense in the judgment that's, uh, that's coming. Let's keep moving because in chapter 9 it starts with nevertheless. I'll count that part of chapter 8 or continuation thereof. We'll keep moving here. Nevertheless, the dimness shall be such as was in her vexation, as when at the first he lightly afflicted, that's your King James, I'll come back to that, lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in the Galilee of the nations. Now, that verse, <laughs> you can make something of it if you like, but let me save you some time. The word afflict in the Hebrew can be alternately rendered. So in the latter time he hath brought honor on the way of the sea. I know it sounds strange to our ears, but afflict and honor, it's a subtle subtlety of the Hebrew that the, the actual sense of the verse may be quite different than you get it as it would read in the classical English. Now, to get at this, so you don't think I'm just, you know, making this up, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. The first 11 verses are very familiar to you, I'm sure. It's the famous temptation of Jesus Christ, as it's called. And you know, you, you know the three temptations where Satan tempts Jesus Christ, and each uh, misquoting the Word of God, by the way, so recognize that's one of Satan's favorite tricks. And that reminds you, of course, in your notepads to put Acts 17:11. I haven't mentioned that in a while, but I want to make sure you're kept conditioned to that. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Luke tells you not to believe anything Chuck Mister tells you. Right. It says that uh, Acts 17, 11, speaking of the Bereans, these are more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they, re in Thessalonica they had a big revival. Boy, they embraced the word, turned on great. Then he goes to Bereans. The Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, but they searched the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. And so I want to remind you that's uh, the capstone of our ministry. You know, you've got to, distrust me adequately to do your own homework, and I'll throw enough heresy out to make sure you do, but in any case, but in any case, Satan, of course, misquotes in the first four verses uh, three times, and uh, Jesus answers him each time, quoting. It's interesting that uh, Jesus seems to quote most of the time from the book of Deuteronomy, one of his favorite books, so I commend the book to your study. The book of Deuteronomy is exciting, but we're going to pick it up verse 12. Well, verse 11, of course, the devil leaveth him, but the angels came and ministered to him. And then verse 12, when, Now when Jesus had heard that John, that's John the Baptist, was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. See, so that's the first link now. You see that when we speak in Isaiah of Zebulun and Naphtali, unless you've got a Bible map, you may not know what area, there are tribal names that they're referring, they're used geographically here. Well, it's, it's around the Sea of Galilee, you see, because that's where Capernaum and all that is. So in other words, um, leaving Nazareth, which is westward, he, go, he moves eastward to the Galilee area. Uh, he came to dwell in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken 
by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the nations. The people who sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung up. That's the quote. And then he goes on, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is going to Israel. And that's often confused because this is often quoted because it's the Galilee of the nations. The Galilee area was regarded by the Jews as a somewhat Gentile area. And across the sea, of course, he had the capitalist. He had a lot of the Roman cities and so forth. So this, it wasn't really Jewish, if you will. And you may recall that the uh, cynical phrase that emerges in the Gospels, can any prophet come out of Galilee? And you remember that phrase? And the person who said that, the Pharisee who said that, hadn't done his homework because there are two prophets that, out of the Old Testament that came out of Galilee. A guy by the name of Jonah and a guy by the name of Nahum. It's interesting that both those prophets have their ministry to Nineveh, capital of Assyria. The more you think about that, the more stranger it is. You mean in the Old Testament, we have a ministry to the Gentiles. See, normally in the Old Testament, you have the focus is, of course, Israel and things as they impact Israel. But twice we have a prophet raised to go to Nineveh. Jonah, as you recall, not only does he go there reluctantly, to say the least, but then when he has an amazing revival, he's upset about it. First of all, he didn't want to go in the first place. That didn't work. So when he finally does go, and he runs around town with a dourly saying, 40 days and comes destruction. That's a real sales pitch, isn't it? <laughs> the king of Nineveh repents, and the town puts sackcloth and ashes, and they repent. So God forestalls the judgment. What's Jonah's reaction? I knew you'd do that. <laughs> he wanted them judged. He had no use for the Nineveh. They were, they were his enemies, you know. I suppose the analogy is probably not a far-fetched one, is, uh, is to have a Jewish prophet sent to the Nazis. See? Didn't want to, wouldn't be too exactly excited about going. But then when they repent and they're saved, that really tees them off. Thing. So, about 100 years later, Nahum is called to go to Nineveh. And they get the judgment. But they're both interesting. They're both out of Galilee. Anyway, uh, this, is, this, is, this passage in Matthew alludes to that and lifts off chapter 9, verse 2 on, as we talked about. But the other thing I want to mention was that Matthew, it, if you notice there's a slight difference in language, Matthew is quoting from the Septuagint. Now, one of the things, and it's not that big a deal here perhaps, one thing I want you to keep in mind is that the book of Isaiah that you and I have was translated into Greek three centuries before Christ was born. About 285 B.C. they started. They finished about 270 B.C. The fact that it was in black and white Three, almost three centuries before Christ was born, will be very important to us, not just because of the Messianic prophecies, but because of some other things also that Isaiah will lay out for us in breathtaking detail as we move. But let's keep going, so I don't misuse my time here. Verse 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They dwell in the land of the shadow of the death, and upon them hath the light shined. And of course, that was the, the quote we just finished reading in uh, Matthew. Verse 3, Thou hast multiplied the nation and increased the joy. In the King James, it says not increased, but most scholars believe that's an error. There's a very subtle detail on one of the Hebrew letters that changes the sense of it. And many of the experts believe that that is one of the subtle errors. It actually turns out that with the not in there, you can make a sense of it. It has an impact. But uh, the best scholarship comes down on the side that the word not is not there as one of those those details. But anyway, thou hast multiplied the nation and increased the joy. They rejoice before thee according to the joy in the harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. Now that may confuse the rod of his oppressor, that, that phrase in the Hebrew is equivalent to taskmaster. When I use that phrase, of course, that echoes a little more of Exodus 5 and all of that. When Moses came from Midian, remember, and had his dialogue with Ewell Brenner, you know. Okay. <laughs> now, by the way, there are, it's interesting that in verse 5, for every battle of the warrior is confused with noise, the garments are rolled in blood, and this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. It's kind of interesting that if you start studying the Battle of Armageddon, not just in Revelation 16, but also in the Old Testament, those same three elements are there. Your reference, of course, to Revelation 16, starting about verse 14. In Zechariah 14, 13, this idea of the armor and tumult, that makes sense. Isaiah 63 is going to talk a great deal about Jesus Christ's bloodstains. 
as he fights for his people in Isaiah 63. And it's also ties to Revelation 14:20. The idea of being rolled in blood is very vivid as we get to Isaiah 63. And then the burning and the fuel of fire and all of that is reminiscent of Isaiah 66 and uh, Joel 2. We're going to talk enough about that later when it gets much more of the main theme, so I won't badger it now, other than just to mention that some of these same patterns are emerging in the language of Isaiah early here. Verse 5, for every battle of the warrior is confused with noise, the garments rolled in blood, and this shall be the burning forth. Those three, the structure of that sentence is very much the structure of those prophecies about Armageddon. But all of this is sort of rushing through lightly because we're going to get plenty of this before Isaiah 2. But we're now going to encounter, as Isaiah does, two verses that leap out at you as two of the most elegant verses in the Old Testament. They are rich with uh, significance. By the way, a couple of things. Uh, when you're in Israel, you'll come across the idea that one reason they did, the Jews did not accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah is because he didn't bring them their temple. You see, and it's interesting, they're setting themselves up for one who is going to be accepted as Messiah, who will bring them their temple, okay? But part of that whole idea is, today they argue that the Messiah isn't the Son of God, he's just a great leader. That's the, the conception is altered. The idea that the Messiah of Israel is to be the Son of God is clear in the Psalm. Psalm 2 makes hammers that home. Well, all through, you can, you, can, you can make a whole study of the predictions of the Messiah, the foot, I call it the footprints of the Messiah in the Old Testament, that he indeed is the Son of God. One of those passages right here before us, verse 6 and 7 of Isaiah, you've heard it a dozen times, you've seen it on Christmas cards, and it's tragic that sometimes the most familiar verses are the ones we skip over because we don't really catch everything that's there. Let's try to look at it freshly. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Let's just start with that. It's very typical in Hebrew poetry to have two ideas in juxtaposition. You and I think of poetry in sense of sound or meter, and the Hebrew does too occasionally, but that's not the emphasis. The emphasis in Hebrew poetry is the juxtaposition of ideas. You notice that a lot in the, all through the Proverbs. They're all structured that way. They, they seem to say the same thing twice, two different ways. Sometimes they're the same thing twice, and sometimes they're the opposites. But there are always two ideas in juxtaposition. Psalms, you see that too, but the Proverbs probably is the most vivid, particularly in the English. Well, here you have, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Very Jewish kind of sounding phrase, but recognize that's not the same thing. For unto us a child is born, that speaks of his humanity. For unto us a son is given, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world, right, that he gave us his only begotten son. It's right here in the first few sentences. A child is born, a son is given. It's an echo, in a sense, of Isaiah seven fourteen that we spent time on last time, the virgin birth. And then it goes on, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. When did that happen? When did Jesus Christ have the government on his shoulder? The only thing I remember on his shoulder was a cross, huh? When did Jesus Christ have the government on his shoulder? Don't think he did. That's yet future. And be on the alert for the heresies that are again emerging in the Christian church. These are heresies that almost destroyed human history the last 19 centuries. The idea that God is through with Israel. Nonsense. Those arguments should have ended on May 14th of 1948. God is not through with Israel. Paul spent three chapters in Romans hammering that home. That he's, Israel is set aside temporarily. Israel is blinded until the fullness of Gentiles be come in. Come in where? Remember Romans 11.25, we quote it all the time. For blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. What is the fullness of the Gentiles? The church. Come in where? And as I've mentioned several times, but I'll just hammer it again. I believe God's dealing with Israel and the church is mutually exclusive. Church was not started until Israel had rejected the kingdom. The church will be complete before God once again takes up Israel. Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming back twice, once for his church and once for Israel. He's coming back to rule the world through Israel. Strange idea. There are people around selling all kinds of heresies that the promises to Israel devolve on the church. Because Israel rejected her Messiah, she forfeited those promises, and those promises now are the church, and they speak of spiritual Israel and so forth. Seventy-three times in the New Testament, Israel is mentioned always nationally. Always, well, there's one that's maybe a little gray, but 72 of the 73 clearly nationally, national Israel. 
Jesus Christ speaks twice in the seven letters, seven churches, of those that would call themselves Jews and are not. Those that would make the church Israel, which is not. Paul divides the world into three categories, Jews, Gentiles, and the church. If you're in the church, you're neither Jew nor Gentile. You're in his body. Don't get confused on that point. Jesus Christ says, those who say they are Jews and are not are the synagogue of Satan. That's Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. He says the same thing again in Revelation 3, chapter, verse 9. So be on the alert for some strange ideas that are widely sold, widely sold on TV and radio and tapes and books. Don't be conned by the Reconstructionists or the Dominion Theologists. If you want to do your homework in this area, one of the outstanding books is Hal Lindsey's Road to Holocaust. Those doctrines led to the Holocaust in Europe, and those doctrines are going to lead to the Holocaust again. That's going to make the last one look like a small beginning. You often see on, in Israel, never again. Sorry, wrong. Daniel in chapter 12 says there would be a time of trouble, yet future, that the world had never seen and never would see again. And Jesus quoted that as being yet future from the, time, from the abomination of desolation. In his private briefing to his disciples in Matthew 24 and 25, the secret briefing he gave to Peter, James, and John and Andrew. And the key, the key verse of that is verse 15. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Highly technical thing, but learn what it is. Do your homework. That ushers in a time of trouble that the world has never seen to that day. It's interesting, of course, Jesus was crucified. Uh, 38 years later, the Roman legions under Titus Vespasian leveled the city. It's interesting that Caligula ordered Petronius to put his image in the Holy of Holies. He tried. That would have been the abomination of desolation. Petronius found out the reaction of the Jews and decided not to do it. Caligula ordered his death when he found out. He obviously was angry. Caligula died. The message at sea that got to Judea on Caligula's death preceded by some strange set of circumstances the, the, the order for Petronius' death. And so he never was executed. But it's interesting that the Romans tried to execute a abomination of desolation. Those days never pulled it off. Abomination of desolation never happened. It's going to happen when television coverage is predicted. News at 11, huh? verse 6. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Well, that's a strange idea. Is that a New Testament idea? You bet it is. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33. I've mentioned this before, but I'll keep it in front of us because there are those that are going to try to confuse you on this subject. When Gabriel is telling Mary about the birth of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 1, in verse 32, he says, Gabriel tells Mary, He shall be great, he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That's not the throne of God the Father that he's on now. It's the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob for a thousand years. Is that what it says? Forever. That ever. That ever. To take Candle's version. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. What's the thousand years? Well, a thousand years is the, the interval between the resurrections and the interval during which Satan is bound. Different issue. How long, is, how long does Jesus Christ reign over the house of Jacob? And why is it called the house of Jacob? So you don't get confused about Israel. It's 12 tribes. Peter wrote his letter, check them, to the 12 tribes of Israel. There are no lost 10 tribes. Anyway, enough of that. Back to <laughs> chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, to be precise, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Some people say there's four titles because they say it's Wonderful Counselor. That sounds neat because it makes a neat little package and there's some aspects to it, except they're both nouns. Wonderful, Counselor, and so on. When was Jesus Christ called wonderful? Boy, gotcha, huh? Judges 13. Judges 13. This is where you murmur and say, oh, yes, like you remember, see? Okay. You all know the story of Samson, or at least part of the story of Samson. His parents were told supernaturally beforehand that he'd be born. Manoah, his father gets a special announcement. Verse 8, Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God whom thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. 
The woman made haste and ran, told her husband, Behold, the man hath appeared to me, and who came unto me the other day. And Manoah rose and went after his wife and came to the man and said, Art thou the man who spoke to the woman? He said, I am. Interesting phrase, I am. I'm always alert to that. Because that's the voice of the burning bush. Not necessarily here, it may turn out to be, but I'm just be alert to that. Because when Jesus said to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am, we miss what he said, but the Pharisees didn't. They tried to stone him because he was declaring to be the voice of the burning bush. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do under him? The angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I have said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I command, did her shall uh, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made uh, ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I shall not eat of thy food. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? That's kind of interesting. The angel normally would say, gee, don't do me honor. Do, I'll worship the Lord only. But this angel is interesting. It's like the one in Joshua 5. He allows a certain degree of deference here, doesn't he? Interesting. The angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is, what? Wonderful. As my suggestion, my conjecture, not a hard sell, but I believe that this is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And it goes on, you can read the rest of the story of Samson on your own. His name called Wonderful. Now you can you can take that many ways. Another way to say the another answer if when was Jesus Christ called Wonderful, I'd say the first few verses of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, capital, title, who is it? Jesus Christ. All things are made by him without him was not anything made that was made. He is the creator of the universe. You know, in our mind's eye, we often visualize, well, that's God the Father. Somehow, Jesus, we see him as the Redeemer. Boy, he's, he's the creator himself. It says so clearly in John chapter 1. He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. His name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor. Boy, that's easy. Lots of places that you can point to Jesus Christ as Counselor, but let me give you an unusual one. Proverbs chapter 8. And this is perhaps a little speculative, but it's uh, conjectural. But the eighth chapter of the book of Proverbs extols wisdom. The real subject of chapter 8 of Proverbs speaks of wisdom, but it personifies it in the first person singular. And there are some scholars that feel it is idiomatic of Jesus Christ. But in any case, he is the counselor on it goes. I mean, there's many places that that is expressed. The mighty God, the word is El. There's many places that the, the, the title of God, the name El, El this or El that, alludes to Jesus Christ, but we've just read one of them last week. Remember? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. The virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and call his name what? Emmanuel. Okay. And that turns out anyway, that's the, the mighty God. Now, the next one's a little confusing. The everlasting Father. On the one hand, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. At the same time, John also, in his first three verses of his gospel, makes clear that there's distinction between them. What that translation should say is the Father of eternity. The Father of eternity. You and I have no capacity to imagine or even conceptualize eternity. And as I've mentioned several times, I'll remind you, you know, we all live in timelines. We tend to think of time as linear and absolute. Because we do our little timelines in school, on the blackboard. We start at the left, go to the right with a little line, a birth, a death, whatever. And so when we come to conceptions like eternity, we think of a line that starts at infinity over there and goes to infinity over there. We think of inf eternity as having lots of time. Well, that's tragic because that's not what eternity is all about. Eternity is being outside the time domain altogether. In modern physics, we know that time is a physical property. You tell me your mass and your acceleration and what gravitational field you're in, and you have, then we can relate to your time. In the absence of that, there is no time. We talked about that in Genesis. 
God created the world in six days. Were they 24-hour days? I don't know. But in, as in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, it clearly he intends us to understand them as 24-hour days. Who's 24-hour days? God's. Who's around? Adam wasn't. Didn't show up until day five, or day, uh, day six, excuse me, right? That's when the clocks sink. So on our clock, it's 15 billion years, or pick your number, and God's clock, it's six days. So the whole issue of how many days does it has to do with an ignorance of Einstein's theory of relativity. It's relative. Tell me the mass of God and his, the gravitational field he's in, and we can talk about his timeline. See, that's our own ignorance. You talk about fate versus free will. Are we predestined or do we have choice? Hey, that issue only comes because we're in, within a half a dimension of time. We live in three spatial dimensions, high with length, and a, a half a dimension of time. I say half a dimension because we can move forward and look back. We can't look forward or move back. It's half a dimension. Right? How many of you remember tomorrow? <laughs> if I get any hands, I want to see you later, right? But see, the whole paradox that we think of as a paradox, because we're within the time domain, if you've had any training in paradox resolution, the way you knew that is you go up one scale, the meta system, if you will. And that, but that problem goes away once you realize you're outside, that God is outside time altogether. And without the benefit of Einstein's uh, general theory and without the benefit of modern physics, H.A. Ironside many years ago dramatized exactly this issue with what is now known rhetorically in the field as Ironside's door. He, he, he hypothesizes that he's going down a hallway, sees a door. Over the door it says, whosoever will may enter. He looks at it. He has total free will. He can go through the door or not. He decides to. Goes through the door. On the other side of the door, he encounters a banquet room. There's an elegant table set. There's a place. And he goes, and he looks, there's a, a, a place card with his name on it. They're expecting him. Blows him away. He looks back at the door he just came through, and over it says, on his side, it says, foreordained before the foundation of the world. Two sides of the same door. One is seen from within the time domain, one from outside. No paradox, not, from, not in those terms. When did God first start dealing with you? Before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 4. You and I have no ability to grasp that. Paul tried hard. He spent six chapters in Ephesians trying to get it through. But there's no way that we can really appreciate that. The Father of Eternity, a title of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. We're familiar with that one for lots of reasons. Romans 5.1, is your verse on that? Or Luke 2.14, what do the angels say? I heard some commentary. I haven't checked it. They say that angels never sing. Only the redeemed can sing. Well, maybe. I don't really buy that because uh, uh, there was one angel that had elegant singing voice. And we'll encounter him in Isaiah 14. There's a chariot bim that got into a lot of trouble. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with justice and with righteousness from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. Zeal of the Lord of hosts, the jealousy of the Lord of hosts. And from here, if you like, you can do a study of sanctified jealousy. Paul talks about that, his jealousy for you as believers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, for those of you who want to start on that tra uh, trip and go down that road. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. We see that on Christmas cards. It always intrigues me what, with such a popular verse, and yet, boy, is it pregnant with insight in terms of God's whole plan. God's overview, and two little verses from the virgin birth, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, to the government of eternity. Interesting. This perhaps also amplifies what Jesus Christ said when he said, all power is given unto me. We read that in Matthew 28, near the end of Matthew's gospel. We probably have no conception of how far that really reaches. But moving on, verse 8. The Lord sent a word unto Jacob, and it lighteth upon Israel. And again, you have those two words. When Jacob's name was changed, it's interesting how in the Scripture, when people's names are changed, they generally stick. When Abraham was changed to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah, from that point on, that's the way they're always referred to. Jacob, not so. When he was in the flesh, 
They called him Jacob. On those rare occasions when he was really walking by the Spirit, he was called Israel as, a, as, an, as an individual. It's always interesting. We always have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Praise God for that. If God can justify Jacob, there's hope for all of us. The Lord sent, unto, sent a word unto Jacob, and it lighteth upon Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim, and the inhabitant of Samaria. See, again, Ephraim's used as a synecdoche, that is, a, as a generic for the northern kingdom, and, uh, and the inhabitant of Samaria, that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, the bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them to cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of Rezin against him, Rezin being the king of Assyria, and join his enemies together, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. See, this is Isaiah again continuing the this uh, dirge of the judgment coming on the northern kingdom. We find a phrase then at the end of verse 12, for all this... His anger is not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Don't misunderstand that phrase. It's not that his hand is stretched out for saving. It's his hand is stretched out for smiting. We tend to reach that, you know, that his hand is stretched out. We generally somehow impute to that, you know, our New Testament perspective. No, no, no. In this case, it's a judgment thing. For all this, his anger is not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Don't visualize a hand of grace. Visualize a clenched fist, if you will, or something, if you want to get the idiomatic. Now, the reason I emphasize is that phrase occurs four times. You'll see in the English the, the stanzas of Isaiah. We'll see this in verse 12, verse 17, verse 21, and chapter 10, verse 4. The first four verses of chapter 10 really seem to be uh, more properly conceived as part of chapter 9. Bear in mind, again, chapter divisions are man's addition about the 14th century, 15th century. And another little ground rule you'll discover as you study the Bible that more often than not, the chapter divisions are in the wrong place. If you're reading a critical chapter, picking up a verse or two from the previous chapter, it'll be instructive. Even such famous passages like 1 Corinthians 13, start a verse early. We're going to see that in Isaiah 53, the the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. You really start two or three verses earlier in chapter 52. So recognize, always keep in mind that chapter divisions are man's editing and often done with an incomplete perspective. So they're just, they're convenience, but they're nothing more than references. Don't attach too much significance to the chapter breaks. Anyway, we're down to verse 12. For the people turneth not unto him who smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush, in one day. And we're going to compare this to Isaiah 19 when we get there. I won't badger it here. But there is, verse 15, one of these little hints that's going to be meaningful to you, those of you that are students of the book of Revelation. Notice verse 15, the ancient and honorable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. These are idioms that are strange to our ears because they, come, they emerge from a different cultural background. But again, the book of Revelation is in code. The writer of the book of Revelation assumes you have a full command of the rest of the Scriptures, Old and New Testament. Every phrase in the book of Revelation is in code. Every one of those codes are explained somewhere else in the Scripture. And one of the evidences of the integrity of the design of these 66 books is that if you study the Re book of Revelation thoroughly, competently, it'll take you into every book in the Bible. Every book in the Bible. But when we encounter these phrases in the book of Revelation, it sounds strange or bizarre. It's only because we're not familiar with the idioms of the Old Testament. And as we go through Isaiah, we're going to pick up several that will really give you a totally different insight in the book of Revelation. Don't misunderstand me. I t every place that I have screwed up, and there have been many of them, if you listen to my early tapes, I make a number of mistakes. Every place I've made a mistake is because I didn't take it literally enough. By now, you've gotten to know me pretty well. You know, I'm a nut on this. I really am an extremist in that sense, even to the encryption thing we talked about last time. Every place in Scripture I see a prophet read another prophet, he always takes it literally. When Daniel reads Jeremiah, he takes him literally. And I've sold that for 20 years. And my early tapes in Revelation, I talk about Revelation 17, 18, and I'm guilty of, indeed, there are some allegorical aspects to Revelation 17, 18. But the literalness of the city of Babylon being rebuilt, I was blindsided on. I gave intellectual assent to the possibility, but I, I didn't really embrace it. And how stupid 
if I'd done my homework on Isaiah 13 and 14 and, and Jeremiah 15 51, uh, I'm quickly, of course, redoing those masters, right? But it's interesting, whenever I've made a mistake, it's because I didn't take it literally enough. And when we get to, we're short, we will, we'll get to uh, Isaiah 13 and 14 again here shortly. It's going to be a grabber in terms of what Saddam Hussein has been up to and what the real significance of the Persian Gulf situation is. It's got nothing to do with Baghdad. It has to do with 62 miles south. A city called Babylon is literally being rebuilt and fulfilling the details of Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 50 and 51. And uh, we'll, we'll obviously develop that when we get there. But here's the insight. The ancient and the honorable, in other words, the reliable prophets, the ancient and the honorable, he is the head. And the prophet who teaches the lies, he is the tail. Now, those are idioms that are a little strange to our ears, yet remember those because in the book of Revelation, you've got all kinds of torment that are in the tales. Revelation 9 and so on. So bear that in mind as you go in those forages. Verse 16, for the leaders of this people caused them to err, and they who are led of them are destroyed. You know, I can't help but think how, and I'm hoping most of you in this group are well instructed so you can just chuckle with amusement at the characters, I'll try to use euphemistic words, I am on a public platform, of the so-called Jesus Seminar. You know, I suppose if they cast enough votes, maybe God would resign, I think. I said, these guys who have fancy degrees, who have stature in, uh, of sorts in some academic community, who have no concept of what the Bible is all about. Well, Jesus really didn't say this. Oh, wait a minute. Most of what he said were quotes from the Old Testament. What do you do to the Old Testament? The one thing that really comes home is if you're going to buy the package, buy the whole package. Don't start cutting and scissoring it or it'll all unravel. What makes the Bible exciting is its integrity. Every word, every number, every place name, every detail ties together in ways that we're just now discovering in the original texts and what have you. So, Anyway, what scares me is how they're going to be held accountable. You know, it's one thing for you and I to make a, you know, an error or a, a little blind side on some subtlety. It's quite another to be unabashedly apostate, to unabashedly publicly, before audiences of millions, cast clouds on the words of Jesus Christ. We call him our kinsman redeemer. We need to remember what the kinsman redeemer really was all about. You and I look to Jesus Christ as our kinsman redeemer because he's redeeming the land to Israel. He's redeeming us to the Father. Fantastic. The kinsman redeemer is also the avenger of blood in the family. If there was an injury to the family, the kinsman redeemer was the one. He's the avenger of blood that the guy was fleeing to the city of refuge on. And we're going to see that presented in Isaiah as we get later in the book. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they who are led of them are destroyed. Remember what Jesus said, if someone caused the least of these, speaking of the children, to err, it would be better if he had never been born. Better if a millstone was hung around his neck and so forth. Remember those, the strong language didn't mess around. Verse 17, therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall he have mercy on their fatherless or widows, for everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. And here's the phrase again. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. In other words, it ends another stanza. Verse 18. For wickedness burneth as the fire, shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest, and they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of fire. No man shall spare his brother." And he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, and he shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Rough stuff. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, and Manasseh, and they together shall be against Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. There's one more stanza of the same kind of dirge here. We'll take the four verses of chapter 10 as part of our study of 9. Woe unto them who decree unrighteous decrees and who write grievousness which they have prescribed to turn aside the needy from justice and to take away the right from the poor of my people that the widows may be their prey, that they may rob the fatherless. What will ye do in the day of visitation and the desolation which shall come from far? 
To whom will ye flee for help, and where will ye leave your glory? Without me they shall bow down unto the prisoners, they shall fall under the slain, for all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And he's going to continue then and talk about the judgment coming upon Assyria, and then he'll talk about the remnant returning and so forth. And we'll stop there for tonight rather than start getting into that. Next time we'll talk about not only chapter 10, we'll finish this judgment on Assyria. We'll jump into chapter 11. Chapter 11 has a lot to say that will be useful to your understanding of the book of Revelation because it deals with idioms for the Holy Spirit that are very unique to the Old Testament, very foreign to our ears in the New. And that'll help illuminate several things in the, in the book of Revelation. He'll also talk about the return of Israel the second time. The first time was after Babel, and the second time started May 14th of 1948. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll probably take the occasion to review the passage in Ezekiel that predicts the very day that Israel was reestablished as a nation and the very day that the city of Jerusalem on June 7th fell under the Star of David. So we'll talk about that a little bit next time. You'll notice as we move through Isaiah, it gets more and more contemporary. Right now, we're obviously heavily hitting this judgment on Assyria, and you and I have sort of a passing interest in that because it's history. There are a few places where it echoes of, of coming judgment in the future, but they're sort of veiled at the moment. But it's interesting. You know, we sit here and we hear Isaiah prophesy and hammer away at Ahaz and the people of what's coming. And we can't help but sort of smugly from the comfort of our own chair saying, gee, didn't they listen? Didn't they see it was coming? I mean, after all, they had plenty of warning, right? Wait a minute, gang. The Bible says that at the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ, there's going to be a super state emerging in Europe. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, all it goes. Right now we're seeing the sovereignties of those nations coalesce, coal and the others. We have a super state in Europe, a population three times the size of the United States, industrial might that is the classic heartland concept for control of the planet Earth. Emerging in Europe, while all this is going on, that's kind of interesting. The Bible says, well, all this is going on, the Soviet Union is going to arm our allies. It lists the allies, they're all in place. The Persian Gulf is not over yet. The Soviet allies of both Syria and Iran are sitting there. Gorbachev, has, he's the wild card there. They have a military that's at least three times the size of ours. We're very proud of our military, and we have a right to be. They did an incredible job. But let's back up a minute, gang. They had six months to move the supplies. They planned a strategy against a, a uh, opponent that has the economic prowess of Kentucky. They were against a leader. Schwarzkopf said it eloquently. You know, he's, he's an incompetent leader, and we had plenty of time to plan it. If something starts to emerge again, you're not going to have six months to move supplies in. You may have two weeks. So it's a different ballgame. Let's take a look at our military. It's excellent. You know, as a naval academy guy, I have to admit that in my time in the defense establishment, I've gotten very cynical about the, our defense establishment. I stand back in awe and impressed. I have profound respect for what they pulled off. They're really great. But let's keep it in perspective. If the Soviets start playing in the game, you've got some other things to consider. 100 million Muslims in their constituent base, a third of their population are Islamic. They're going to play for, with the West? No way. They got an economy that's in real trouble. But they got a military, as I say, two or three times the size of ours. It's a solution looking for a problem. They haven't played that card yet. What's Iran going to do? Haven't played that card yet. While we're watching Iraq, what's Syria done? Take over Lebanon. The Middle East is a long way from being finished, and Ezekiel 38 is in place. All the allies are in place. Ezekiel says that Russia is the one that's going to arm them. They have the technology, Ezekiel 38, is in place. Interesting. While that's all going on, we also see as part of the scenario, the literal city of Babylon is going to reemerge as a major world center. It's not a major center yet, but it's being rebuilt. How fascinating. Don't confuse the fall of Babylon in 539 B.C. with the destruction of Babylon that's described in the Bible. That's never happened. It's got to happen yet. It will happen in the 70th week of Daniel. It's emerging. Saddam Hussein has spent 19 years rebuilding the city. It's starting. Long way from where it needs to be, but it's happening. The Bible three times in the New Testament says the third temple will be rebuilt. Matthew 24, 15, Jesus makes it the centerpiece of his confidential briefing to his disciples. Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. John talks about in Revelation chapter 11, the temple, the literal temple. Right now we've got the best scientists 
Israel has, trying to figure out the exact location. Is it north or south? There's arguments both ways. It's interesting. But the point is they're discussing it. They got people scanning the world for the right kind of marine snails to raise the purple and the blue that the ancient Levitical ways. When we were there, we actually saw the wiring diagram for the temple. Can you believe that? Electrical wiring diagram and so forth. It's happening. Are they actually laying bricks yet? No, but they've trained 200 priests in four yeshivas that are ready to officiate. They've made the implements. Are they building the temple tomorrow? No. Will it be a week, a month, a couple of years? I have no idea. But it's happening. Soviet's happening. Europe's happening. Israel's happening. Soviet Union is yet to play their card. What does that all mean? It's not one thing, not the one little check verse because of some theory or some chart or some obscure calculation from the book of Hezekiah chapter 3. No. -uh. I mean, that's just a rhetorical device. I'm just, don't go look for Hezekiah. <laughs> what does that mean for you and I? You know, we glibly, all of us here, we've been told about Jesus' coming and, and we embrace the Bible. We've committed ourselves to Jesus Christ. Boy, if there's anyone in here who has not committed their lives to Jesus Christ, see me afterwards. Really. I'm going to take for granted most of you in some way have already done that. But wait a minute, gang. Where are we today? Right in the middle of the climax. It's brewing. It's happening. First of all, the tribulation is the last half of the 70th week of Daniel, the seven-year period. That seven-year period is defined by a treaty that's going to be enforced by the coming world leader, this dramatic, fabulous guy that the world will embrace. And everybody will be deceived, even the very elect, if it were possible. Now, the 70th week of Daniel is defined by that treaty. He can't enforce that treaty until he comes to power. He can't come to power until he appears publicly. And Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2 that he cannot appear publicly while we're here. The church is going to be called out first. The pre-trib, the mid-trib, the post-trib, the pre-wrath, all those positions are inadequate because they don't address the real issue. And the real issue is that the rapture of the church occurs before the 70th week of Daniel can even begin. If you really understand God's overview, God's plan for Israel, and God's plan for the church, they're mutually exclusive. And God is getting ready to deal with Israel. You can see it left and right. So that means time is short. Now the question is, what does that do for your priorities and mine? Well, one thing it does is it's got you out here on an evening to study Isaiah. Praise God for that. I hope that's just the beginning. You know, one of the things that we all are admonished to do, and I certainly encourage, and that's to read the Bible every day, devotionally. Five minutes a day, a chapter, pick your program, whatever, but stick with it. Devotionally. Great, because that's the way God will deal with you. It's a dialogue. You pray to Him, He'll answer you. Typically, not always, but typically in the Word. That's His approach to communicate to your life, your decisions, your details. That's all great. But I have another strong suggestion, and I'm really convinced that we need to talk about this a little bit. There's something else I'm going to challenge you to do. All of us have a hobby. Some of us have cameras. Some of you fly airplanes, models, sports, golf, shooting, hunting. We all have hobbies. My suspicion is you know more about your hobby than your profession because it's a labor of passion. It's your first love. Whatever it is, collecting stamp. There's some area that you find satisfaction in that you probably know more about than most people would know normally, right? Because it's your hobby. I'm going to give you a challenge, gang. I'm going to suggest you make the Bible your hobby for a while. Not just read it devotionally. Not just come to a Wednesday night study. That's great. But make a commitment to yourself between you and the Lord to learn this book, these 66. But take one at a time. Whichever one sort of the Spirit draws you into. Instead of blowing 20 bucks on dinner down the street, drop by a bookstore, pick up a commentary. And read it. Find out those authors that you sort of rap with. We all have our favorites. As I've mentioned to you before, I've had the privilege by the grace of God to be tutored by three of the greatest guys in the biblical fundamental world. I've been an intimate friend with Walter Martin before he passed away for some almost 20 years. My partner and I were the ones that brought him out to the West Coast. And of course, Hal Lindsey and I are intimate friends for 20 years, as you may know. And of course, Chuck and I, I've had the privilege of being close to him for also about 20 years. So I've had the privilege, by the grace of God, to be personally tutored by three of the greatest guys that you could dream about if you were having fantasies about how to really learn the Bible, right? And I'm not trying to boast or brag. I'm going to come to another point. You can have the same privilege to be personally tutored by those three guys or anyone else you happen to respond to. 
You can do it at your home, in your car, while you commute, or in your workshop on Saturdays, while you're cleaning up the bench or whatever. It's called cassette tapes. I've, over the years, had more people tell me they've learned more in six months with tapes than they have in 12 years of Christian schools and seminary put together about the Bible. I'm going to suggest to you that this is God's Word. It's supernatural. It'll impact your life. But don't just read it devotionally. You should do that. Don't misunderstand me. I can't find the, quite the right word. I, I, I'm tempted to say master it, but of course you can't. I don't really mean that. But I'm saying really learn the Bible, book by book. Take a book, Daniel or Isaiah or Matthew, whatever the Lord leads. But master it. Study it. Really understand it. Find out what the Bible really has to say. It's your only hope of understanding CNN as things start happening because they don't know what's going on. But they don't even know what an Arab is. Most people don't. It's not genealogical. It certainly can't be. And it certainly isn't geographic. What it really means is Islam. And you know, also, that's another thing that we'll be talking more about as we go here. What is Islam really all about? But my suggestion is, time is ripe. You know, you would have gotten a whole different perspective of the Persian Gulf crisis if we'd really been on top of Isaiah 13 and 14 and uh, Jeremiah 15 and 51 before Saddam Hussein was moving. You've got, got guys like Baker and so forth. They're going to solve 4,000 years of history by running around having a few meetings. Nonsense. Find out what the Bible really says. Because first of all, it's not going to be very long. You're going to run into Daniel. You want to be able to say, hey, I read your book. 